Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at FlexLogic with Jeff Tate, who's going to talk today about using multiple inferencing chips in neural networks. So Jeff, we tend to think about neural networks as an inferencing chip. What happens when you add multiple chips? If designed properly with multiple chips, you can get uh, linear increases in performance. So just to start, why don't we take a look at a neural network model? What does that look like? So neural networks are broken down into layers. And layers basically, uh, like ResNet 50 has 50 layers, something, uh, that's why it's ResNet 50. YOLO V3 has a little over 100 layers. And each layer is taking in an, act, an activation from the previous layer. So layer N, the output of it is an activation, which goes into layer N plus one weights for that layer come in, uh, a computation is done like a convolution or a fully connected layer, etc. And the output of this is activations that go to layer n plus 2. And that continues for the length of the layer until you finally get a result. And the initial input is the image. So the very first input is the image or whatever the data set is that's being processed by the model. So why would you use multiple inference chips here? What's the importance of that? Well, if you have a chip that's got a certain level of performance, there's always going to be some customers who say, can I get twice as much performance or four times more performance? So it's possible to do that, at least in some cases, when you analyze the model. What you need to look at is how can you split the model between two chips or four chips? Well, let's look at the two chip case. The four chip case is just a, an extension of the two chip example that we'll use. And that's been the problem in a lot of the parallel processing over the years, right, is how do you partition whatever processing you're doing and make sure that it, it all is additive as opposed to subtractive in terms of performance? Yes, but in this case, the, the nice thing for us is that the customer knows in advance they want to use two chips and our compiler can uh, not have to figure out on the fly, which is the case in parallel processing and, say, in general purpose computing. With neural models, everything is totally predictable, so we can analyze and figure out exactly how to split the model and whether it'll run well on two chips. So is there overhead in terms of, of using multiple chips versus one? You have to have some communications between the chips. And the faster the communication, which allows the use of more and more chips, the more area and cost it may take. So that's the trade-off. So how do you actually analyze this model to make sure that it can run on two chips or more chips? Right. So what we do is we want to look at some more details. So this is the concept of how the layers work. What we want to look at is what is the activation size, layer by layer? What's the number of max, layer by layer? So if you look at it, what typically is the case is the biggest activations are in the earliest layers. It might look something like this, then bounce back up. And the trend is that the activation slides, sizes tend to typically slowly go down as the number of layers go on. You also want to look at the number of max um, and how many max are done each cycle. The number of max done each cycle roughly tend to correlate in most models with the activation size. So why is this important? If you have two chips, if you want to run at maximum frequency, you need to give them equal workloads. If one chip is doing most of the model and the other chip's only doing a, a bit of the model, you're going to be limited by the throughput of the first chip. So how you split the model between the two chips is important. You want to look for two things. One is you want to have the number of max in this chip be roughly equal to the number of max in this chip in terms of the distribution of workload. But then you have to look at what gets passed between the chips. So at some point you want to slice the model and what you want to look for is a place to slice the model where the activation that you pass is as small as possible. So that the amount of communications bandwidth required and the latency of the transmission is minimal. If you slice the model at a point where the activation is very large, the transmission of the activation can become the bottleneck which limits the performance of the two-chip solution. You've got a lot of trade-offs here, though, because you have more chips, so obviously your costs go up. You potentially have more distance that the signals have to travel as well, which could 
potentially affect how fast they go. How do you overcome that? Well, what you have to do is you have to have a performance tool. The same performance tool that models the performance of a single chip can then be generalized to model the performance of two chips. The performance of any given layer is exactly the same. The issue is how does the transmission of data affect performance? So the mo modeling tool now needs to factor this in. Because everything is deterministic, it's, this is an issue of uh, the, the bandwidth required here, if it's not enough, the bandwidth will limit the throughput. And the issue, if we're talking about, say, doing four chips, is that the general trend here is that the layers are bigger up here. So if you have a four chip solution, you'll need a bandwidth that is bigger because the activations in the first quarter of the model tend to be bigger than activations in the later quarter of the model. So the amount of communications resource you invest in will allow you to go to larger numbers of chips pipeline together, but that'll be an overhead cost that all chips will have to bear even if they're used in a standalone case. This is like driving on a one-lane road versus a four-lane highway, right? Because now you have more lanes and, and more area that you can actually move the data. Right. So in our first chip, the trade-off that we've made is to put in the re ability to transmit data for a model like YOLO V3 uh, without causing any bottlenecks in the two-chip solution. Uh, in future chips that we do, we may put on, uh, uh, and we're doing this with GPIO, in future chips, we may put on CERDES in order to transfer the data more quickly so that we can do multiple chip solutions. And if you think about the way the human brain works, which is the, the neural net neuromorphic type of model, a lot of the computing that's done is typically not 100% accurate, but it is fast. Is that another way to improve the performance of these? Well, neural models, by definition, are not 100% accurate. That's why they all focus on prediction accuracy and when you do things like quantize to run an in integer mode, which is what you do in edge computing, you're giving up a little bit of prediction accuracy for the higher throughput. So yes, there is a trade-off there. Jeff Tate, thanks for a great explanation. Ed, thanks very much.